The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. We're thrilled to be here with you on this Thursday morning. This uh, place that we are at is the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. It's also the home for Autism Live, obviously. And uh, for the next two hours, we're going to be with you giving you lots of information and I hope inspiration and hope uh, I hope that we give you hope. Uh, we try to bring autism to you from a 360 degree perspective because we know this is not one size fits all. We know that wherever you are in the world and however you belong to the autism community, whether you're a parent, a practitioner, you're somebody who's on the autism spectrum, or you're somebody who loves somebody who's on the autism spectrum, that you're part of this community that sees what can happen when we give the proper respect and resources to individuals who are on the autism spectrum. So we welcome you to be a part of that conversation and we hope that at some point we hit on things that are useful to you, but you know the truth is you don't have to wait for that. You can tell us what you need. We had somebody two nights ago write to us and say, I need more information about coaching sports and, and getting our kids involved in sports and man, we had it for you yesterday. I can't always do it that quickly, um, but it just so happened that we had two people on the show yesterday who were coaches who work with individuals who are on the autism spectrum, one who's an autism dad and one who used to be a therapist and is now is a licensed marriage and family therapist. So my goodness, it doesn't get better than that, right? So write to us with your questions, your concerns and your comments and Samantha is going to show you some of the different ways that you can do that. You can, while she's doing that, I'm going to remind you that you can also contact us through our homepage, which is autism-live.com. When you go there, if you want to watch the live show, all you have to do is click on the triangle that is on the computer screen. That will play either the live show or the most recently recorded live show. And if you want to go further back into the archives and stay on that page, all you have to do is click on the little memo tab that's in the upper left hand corner and that will give you 100 of the most recent shows to choose from to sort of see, you know, what's, what's my flavor today? What do I want to know about today? Now to the side of where the show plays is something we call the live feature. If you put your cursor in the box that says your comment and hit, type and hit enter, it will show up here on my screen. And in that way, you and I can have a conversation and much more important, you can ask questions of all the experts that we have here on the show. Now, I do want to point out that this is just one of the many ways to get in contact with us. And Samantha was showing you some of the other ways. We love it when you talk to us on Facebook. We love it when you comment on YouTube and please subscribe to us on YouTube. We really appreciate that. Um, and we love it when you guys talk to us on Twitter. We love it when you talk to us on Periscope. We love all of those things. You can also email me. I will say that one of the benefits of doing it on our homepage, on our live feature, is that it gets to be completely anonymous. The rest of the world doesn't know who you are when you're asking the question, and I certainly don't get to know who you are. I just see a question. I don't get to know where it came from in the world, so it can be completely anonymous. And sometimes, let's face it, sometimes that's what we need. Other times not so much right um, but in any case I mentioned that we have experts on the show and we do we have many many experts I always as an autism mom um, I always wanted to go to conferences and I could never go it just my life didn't fit that uh, where was my kid going to be and what therapy was he going to miss while I was someplace going to a conference, right? But I missed out on talking to the experts. So I always want to bring that to you. So we do have lots of experts on the show, but please 
don't ever confuse me with being one of those experts because I just am not. I, as I mentioned, I'm an autism mom, a proud autism mom. My son was diagnosed when he was two and a half and he is now 14. And oh my gosh, do I have some perspective on that now, you know, having gone through the early intensive behavioral intervention that we went through and life is luscious now. Um, I am under no illusions that exactly what my child needed is exactly what you or your child need. It, as I said, it's not one size fits all. But let me just tell you that I'm in your corner. Whatever it is you need and however you view it, I'm in your corner and want to help you to get to those resources that are so important to you and that are right for you. We always say on the show that we can do this together. And I, I say we can hold hands and do this together and si se puede, right? We can do this. Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, having said all of that, uh, we've got a big, big show for you. And we like to start off on Thursdays with something we fondly refer to as, yes, the jargon of the day. And I love that so many of you write to us now and say that, that you love this. I love that we have colleges and graduate schools that are writing to us and saying that they use our jargon of the day in their classroom. That makes my whole day. Because I remember when I first pitched the idea of doing jargon of the day, people were like, what? You want to do what? And you think people are going to watch that? So for those of you who haven't seen it before, jargon of the day is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to give you the actual definition for it. And I personally like to make fun of it because usually it's a, a definition full of more jargon. And then we like to give you the somewhat watered down version of that so that hopefully you can begin to get your fingers sunk into what is it really that this is talking about. I really feel that that's the only way to take jargon on. So today's uh, term, it's one that we've used before, but we like to review, right? Right. And some people call this the pre-max principle and other people say the pre-mac principle, okay? We're both talking about the same thing. Doesn't this, uh, doesn't this sound like something having to do with interest and banking and I don't know. Um, but this is a really important concept to at least understand, even if you don't remember that it's pre-max principle. So let's take a look at our actual definition. You ready? Pre-max principle, also referred to as the relativity theory of reinforcement, suggests that more probable behaviors will reinforce less probable behaviors. Oh, thank you, pre-max. Now I can go home, right? I don't, even now that hurts my head all these years later, and I know what it means. Okay, so let's take a look at our working definition and see if we can't make some sense of this. Our working definition, pre-max principle, when we make a desirable behavior the reward for doing something less desirable in order to make the less desirable behavior more likely to happen. Okay, it still hurts my head a little bit. But we talk about this all the time that we want somebody to do something that they don't want to do, right? I'm trying to think. Somebody the other day was uh, saying to me that um, they have a person in their family that doesn't want to do the dishes. Uh, and that, you know, it's just torture every night that they don't want to do the dishes. And, and I looked at them and I said, well, I don't want to do the dishes either. <laughs> like, like, is there somebody who wants to do the dishes? I guess maybe, yes, you know, I'm, now that I think about it, Nancy's son, Wyatt, wants to do the dishes because he likes the feel, the sensory feel of the water. But I don't like doing dishes. And this person was saying that the family member, you know, really carries on and, and sometimes throws things and screams and whatever to get out of doing the dishes. And I, I, I stood there and I thought, wow, I wonder if I did that, I could get out of doing dishes, right? Maybe... Maybe my husband would be like, oh, I'm never making her do the dishes again. Uh, not that my husband makes me do the dishes. It's just when they sit there long enough, somebody's got to do them, right? Sometimes he does it. Sometimes I do it. I don't like doing the dishes. So Premax principle says that if we pair doing, for me, doing the dishes with something really desirable, we offer me some sort of reinforcement that I really love, then it's more likely that the dishes will get done, right? And this sort of makes sense, right? Well, 
Um, the truth of the matter is, and I know this will shock all of you, but I love to do what I call scream singing. I'm not a good singer, but I love to sing. And when I like to sing, I like to sing loud because it feels good, right? So uh, I have a little old iPad that sits on a, on a, uh, a stand by the, the dishes. And if I really have to do some dishes and it's really going to be miserable, I will set it up and I have this playlist of Broadway tunes that I can scream sing while I'm doing dishes. And my family puts up with it because the dishes are getting done, right? Uh, so, you know, when the truth of the matter is, is that when I play the iPad and play the music, the dishwashing is more likely to get done. Why? Because it's a highly desirable thing that is happening and that allows me to be able to do it. Now we can utilize this all the time and we do in ABA. We try to pair things that are desirable and offer a reinforcement for things that aren't uh, already reinforcing, right? Nobody has to give you a paycheck for eating your favorite food, but if you know, if I say to you, the only way that you're going to get to eat your favorite food is if you eat this food that isn't your favorite food, which is exactly what Dr. Doreen Grandpache was talking about yesterday for the picky eaters, then, you know, if the only way you get that fabulous chocolate cake that you love so much is that you got to eat one spoonful of your broccoli, is it more likely or less likely that the broccoli is going to get eaten? It doesn't ensure that the broccoli get, gets eaten. It just makes it more likely. This is a powerful, powerful way to look at the world. Instead of feeling like you are completely you, with no power when somebody is doing something that you don't like or not doing something that you want them to do, you can get frustrated about it. You can try to legislate the behavior. You can try to nag them into it. I do that all the time. It doesn't work. Um, or you can think the pre-Mac way and think, okay, what? Thing could I pair with this that would make it more likely to happen? What reinforcer, what paycheck could I put with this thing that would increase the likelihood of seeing this behavior? I'll tell you what, it's the most empowering thing I've ever run across as a parent. Man, it changes everything. You want to talk game changer, pre-Mac principle, the heck out of something, and you will find that Lots of things that you might have thought weren't possible are possible. Great jargon. Pre-max principle. All right. Moving on. We also always have a question of the day. And today's question of the day kind of goes with this. What would make you face your worst fear? And if you think about this for a second, first of all, you got to think about what's your worst fear, right? My husband and I used to always watch The Amazing Race. And, you know, I, I don't know, we don't watch it as much anymore. But we would watch The Amazing Race and, and there was a period of time in which we had considered before we got pregnant and had a child, we actually, in some crazy stratosphere of the universe, considered auditioning to be on The Amazing Race. I don't know what we were thinking because I don't fly well, I don't travel well, um, I don't camp, you know what I mean? I'm afraid of heights, right? But we would always sit there and watch the show and watch that moment when one or both of the people on the team were faced with something like they had to zip line through a jungle or, you know, scale uh, a building in Dubai, you know, and face seriously, you know, heart pumping fear. And sometimes they would be able to do it and sometimes they wouldn't. And my husband and I would have this conversation about what would, you know, because he would always be auditioning me to see if he wanted to be on the show. And he's like, well, what would get you to do it, honey? And, um, and, and I would say, you know, honestly, uh, it would have to be like a million dollars. And in some instances, I don't even think a million dollars would get me to do it, right? When I shaved my head here on the show and, and took it all the way down to the skin, it was so funny to me because that was such a very, you know, capable, I could do that. There was no fear about me being bald for myself and it was such an easy thing to be able to give that dad who uh, had brain cancer and, and it was a way to support him because that's why, why we did it. But there were women that talked to me and said, oh my gosh, I could not have done that and I certainly couldn't have done it in a public way and you know their, their hearts were pumping. But I remember uh, after that, somebody asked me, would I come and get a tattoo with them? 
uh, to support autism parents. And I said, please ask me to do something else because I don't think I can do that. I don't, I, honestly, like, I just don't think I can do that. I don't like needles and I don't like things with color and, you know, even now that stresses me out thinking about it. But if it was the only way to save my child was to get a tattoo, oh, I'd be rolling up my sleeve going, bring it, right? So what would make you face your worst fear? What's the thing that would get you to jump off the bridge? You know, with the parasail thing, not without a... Uh, <laughs> Not, not without a parachute or something, right? Or a bungee cord. What would get you to do it? Because, you know, the reason why we're talking about this is to realize that there are, we each have different things that are uncomfortable for us and that we don't want to do and that some things are motivating enough and some things are not motivating enough. And it's the same thing with our kids. I just yesterday was telling my son about a story of when I was teaching and I had a young man in my classroom who'd always act out. And, um, you know, it was just really, really difficult. And he would act out, I, I started to notice always when we were reading and um, I would ask him to read and man, I would get horrible behavior, horrible behavior. These were seventh graders. And I went to all of his other teachers and I said, what is up with this kid? What is the deal with him? And they all would say, oh, you know, this kid is trouble on legs, which just made my heart hurt, right? This is a seventh grader. And we're already saying, you know, there's nothing we can do. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. But finally, I went to his art teacher and his art teacher said, oh, he's my best student, A student. He's brilliant. Have you seen his artwork? It's amazing. And I said, no, I want to see his artwork. And, uh, and it was amazing. He was a great artist. So what's the deal with that, right? Well, we were reading one of my favorite books in class, A Wrinkle in Time, and he wanted nothing to do with it. So I went to him and I said, hey, um, would you be willing to be our class illustrator? Would you be willing to listen as we read every day and draw a depiction of whatever it was that we covered in the book? What? And he was thrilled. He said, yeah, I'll do that. And suddenly I didn't have this behavior in class, right? So, and I, as far as I know, he's listening to the book and I'm like, you know, puzzle solved, it's all good, right? That would have been too easy. Um, and sometimes we wouldn't get to the end of a chapter and I would assign that chapter and the next chapter for homework. Well, we got a little further into the book and one day he came into class and he said, you know, you didn't, you didn't do the recap at the end of the class. He said, you didn't do the recap of what we talked about. And I said, yeah, well, you know, you were supposed to read that at home. He goes, yeah, but sometimes you talk about it and say what happened. Why didn't you do that today? And I said, well, we just didn't have time. But, you know, you read it, right? And he was like, mm. And I said, what's going on? He couldn't read. And so, and it was his worst fear to be in a class and be called on and have his classmates find out that he couldn't read. This is a seventh grader who was in my class and because of his behavior, and I'd only had him in class for a couple of weeks, but you'd think I would have known that he couldn't read or that somebody else would have called it, right? But he made sure we didn't because his behavior became so great. And now because he had bought into the book because he was drawing and he wanted to draw the pictures correctly, he was willing to face his worst fear. Sometimes we don't know what people's fears are, um, but we always have to be looking for when we meet with resistance or behavior that there's something real going on. And we can't just poo-poo that. We have to make it worthwhile for the person to be willing to even work on it. And that takes a certain amount of sensitivity and patience that we don't always have on a given day. But I think if we can think of it ourselves, we'll get better at it when we're dealing with other people. And that is when it gets exciting. That young man then began to learn how to read because he had a big enough paycheck coming his way for it. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Okay, uh, we always have a topic of the week and uh, our topic goes right hand in hand with what we're talking about, wagging the dog. Sometimes we, you know, I especially, this is why I talk about education and I lose my mind a little bit. Um, sometimes we wag the dog instead of the tail, wag, you know, what, I, I don't even think I have the phrase right. Uh, we need for the dog to wag the tail, not the tail to wag the dog, right? And sometimes that means backing things up and going, wait a second, what are we trying to accomplish here? And is what we're doing 
actually accomplishing that task. I think that sometimes in the autism world, this gets really confused too. And I, I urge all of you, I talk to you about what good quality ABA is all the time. And one of my favorite examples is none other than Logan Shepard. You know, we see kids who do this, right? Who they stim and they do this because this feels good for some reason. For some kids, it's a visual. For other kids, it's just the feel of it. Um, it helps to shake off the way that you're feeling. And we have adults who are on the autism spectrum who say, don't take this away from us. This is what calms us down, right? Um, and I know some ABA providers are like, you know, no, we're, you know, we're, we're gonna get rid of this behavior. And sometimes um, for some kids, what we do is give them a replacement behavior that still fulfills this need, but doesn't prevent them from being able to write. Because if you're in class and you're feeling like this, you can't write at the same time, right? So we make it something more functional. For other kids, this really is the thing that they need to do. And I love to talk about Logan Shepard because Card saw this and said, let's turn, he loves music, let's turn this into this. He's 16 years old and he's a professional drummer. Um, you know, if you're thinking of it in the right way, if you're thinking, how do I serve this individual? How do I help to have this person be able to meet the world from the, from the position that they want to, then the answer will always be right. But if you think, oh, I, if the task is to get rid of this, that's wrong, right? The task is to figure out what this serves and how to better serve the child so that this doesn't hold the child back. And there are ways to do that. Okay, in any case, we've got a great show for you coming up, and I'm running a little bit late here. Shoshana Abraham is gonna be here with us. She is from Getting Caked. Uh, I think everybody needs to get caked every once in a while, right? But there are a lot of us, myself included, who are on the gluten-free, casein-free, the nothing good diet. Right? And it makes it hard. And Shoshana is going to share with us, because tomorrow's my birthday, she's going to share with us some of the different ways that we can get in the kitchen and make things and still work around allergies and have them be luscious and beautiful. So I'm really excited about that. Then a little bit later on this hour, Bonnie Yates, special education attorney, is going to be here with us answering your questions. And then in the second hour, we have Eliana Fajeda from skills she's an amazing woman talk about always she trains all of her people what's the what's in the best interest of the child or the person who's on the autism spectrum and if you follow that you'll be doing the right thing uh she is the queen of that she's here with us to talk about the newest newest product coming out of skills skills living i get so excited when skills does new things and this for those of you who've been asking for something for the older kids 14 and up oh get ready fasten your seat belts it's here so we're going to take a break and then we're going to get caked and isn't that going to be fun stick with us Welcome back to Smarty. This month we're going to be creating a popsicle puzzle. As we do this fun activity, you'll notice these icons will pop up. These icons tell you important information about the skills we're using to create the craft and where you can find them on the skills program. Skills is an ABA based tool that helps parents create a curriculum that will help their children that are on the autism spectrum. Well, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are popsicle sticks, tape, and arts and crafts materials. So step one, you're gonna take your popsicle sticks and lay them down and cover them with tape so they don't move around. Now that my popsicle sticks have been secured with tape, here comes the fun part. You're gonna take your arts and crafts materials, they can be paint, markers, whatever you have, and then you're gonna decorate this with a beautiful picture. This is the beautiful picture that I made. Now what I'm gonna do is remove the tape. And now, as you can see, they come apart. And here is your awesome puzzle. Now, the fun part is trying to assemble the picture that you just made now that it's all been separated. I hope you enjoy this activity with me. Until next time, guys, craft on.
To find more about skills and to access all of the lessons you saw in today's Smart Aid, visit skillsforautism.com and click on the parent icon, Skills, the online autism solution. We're very excited because we're in the Noah's Ark exhibit and we're here with Jason Porter. Thank you for taking us on this tour. Oh, thanks for having us. So you're going to show me around a little bit and show me some of the secrets of the Noah's Ark exhibit, right? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Cool, let's go. Yeah. So Jason, tell us, this is an amazing space. Why is it so incredible for children? One of the values of the Skirball Cultural Center is taking care of the earth and one another. And so this idea of repurposing materials that would otherwise be tossed off was a, was a big component to how we designed the, the galleries. It's based on, you know, certainly the, the story that everyone knows is the one from the Hebrew Bible, the story of Noah. Um, but in our research, we looked at over 200 flood stories from around the world and, you know, many different cultures cultures have flood stories that have similarities, and the similarities that we identified were these three chapters. The storm, some crazy challenge that comes to your life. An ark, a kind of means of survival, a way for a community to come together to survive. And finally, the rainbow, which is this kind of um, symbol of hope, the second chance to make the world anew. Love it. All right, let's take a look through and we're going to talk about some of the learning opportunities that are available here. Sure. We really wanted people to kind of discover what they were supposed to do. For example, this elephant has a gong in the center and there's a little wheel here that you can turn and see what happens. But there's also some hidden things, like there's a little peephole in this polar bear, so it's kind of a, a moment where you could talk with your kids about what does it mean that that polar bear in there only has a small piece of ice to live on, it, and you could talk about kind of the environmental issues that might be associated with it. All right, should we go downstairs? Yeah, let's check out the storm. So, Jason, what do you call this room? Uh, this is called the storm gallery. In one side of the gallery, we have a storm wall, which is all sorts of sounds and sight effects um, to make the storm come to life. we have this, um, what we call the load up. It's fairly intuitive, you know, you put animals onto the conveyor belt and you turn the wheel and they get loaded up onto the ark. Except you can't do both at the same time by yourself. It's kind of layered in the doing, the learning that, that we're really interested in, which is about this notion of working together in order to accomplish something. So, you know, when you first get on the ark, obviously you enter two by two as the story goes. <laughs> and. Um, so the animals in this first section of the ark, you know, they're not quite sure where they should be. They're a little bit nervous about who to hang out with. The gallery is really organized so that the the animals are still in pairs. So we talk a lot about what are the elements of home that you, you need to survive. And it's really a nice kind of intro into the whole experience of being in a community, learning to be together with people who may or may not be the same as us. This gallery of Noah's Ark is, is unique, I think, in in terms of the way that it was designed, that it offers um, a huge variety of experiences in a way that really accommodates people of all stripes and spots. So there are more quiet zones, like we just left in the move-in day, where you can come into this room where you have a lot of large motor things that are happening, including climbing, and we kind of have nicknamed this the arcade. It's kind of the, the chapter in the story where they're making new families and they're mixing with other animals that they've befriended. Oh, we have to talk about uh, we, we can't do a show without talking about poop. about poop. <laughs> so, you know, um, the other fact of life on an ark is that everybody poops. So the challenge is to, you know, clean up. Okay, so we're in the last room, very cool room. What do we call this room? Uh, we call this the Rainbow Gallery. You know, people really get that this is a, a place of hope. Sometimes there's an art making project that it ends in some sort of inspiration, um, that people feel like they're inspired to take action in the world and make it a better place. Thank you so much for showing us everything and telling us about all the wonderful things at the Skirball Center. Logan Shepard. At first glance, he looks like a typical American teenager. He plays in a band, loves hanging out with his friends, he doesn't like doing homework, and he's not really fond of broccoli. But Logan Shepard is not your typical 14-year-old. Logan was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He was nonverbal, 
made no eye contact, and his parents were told to abandon all hope. Instead, his parents began an intensive intervention treatment. At its center was a quality ABA program known as the CARD method. This is Logan Shepherd now. All I really want to say is like, I'm kind of copying Martin Luther King. I kind of have a dream like that one day, like I can just like inspire people and never give up. Cause like, that's what I want to do in life. Cause if I can succeed, they can succeed and I will succeed. To follow Logan's musical journey, visit www.facebook.com slash official drummer rock or at drummer rock on Instagram. For more information on the card method, visit www.centerforautism.com or call 800-345-CARD. Rock on, Logan. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> trying to, uh, just, uh... Jeez. Let me think. <laughs> oh, man, that's a tough one. Yes. Uh, autism, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Welcome back. Well, we are postponing having Shoshana here with us. So I apologize to everybody uh, for the, the mix up with that. And I want to say thank you to everybody who is writing in on uh, Facebook uh, and saying happy birthday. And uh, thank you for liking the blouse. I think sometimes it looks a little too circusy, but I appreciate that. Um, in any case, uh, we want to take just a minute here uh, to do our mindfulness moment because, you know, we love to do our mindfulness moment. And right now, for a lot of people, things are changing, right? And when things change, whether it's your schedule that changes or the way the light hits the earth changes or the colors that are in front of you change, it can be a sensory overwhelm, right? But instead of letting it overwhelm us, one of the things that we can do is acknowledge it and connect with it. And when we do, we will find that we're much more peaceful. So I think it's an ideal time this time of year to take a couple of minutes and it doesn't have to be an hour long hike. You can just take a nature walk. And by the way, you can do this with an individual who's on the spectrum, no matter what age they are, no matter what their capability is. Sometimes it means that you have to have more support with you or be mindful of certain things for safety. I remember when Jem was little, he couldn't just walk down the sidewalk with me. That was a really hard thing for him. So sometimes I needed a second person to make sure that he didn't elope and run into the street. So I'm mindful of that. Um, but you can do it too. Just make sure, invite somebody to come with you and say, here's what I need you to do. Um, but as you go on your nature walk, it's important to not have, you know, like we got to be back in seven seconds, right? You don't, you don't have to have a schedule. Um, but again, not to make it too long, because if you're not used to doing these kinds of things, it can seem overwhelming and it's easy to go too far. So set yourself uh, you know, a relative idea of maybe you want to take this amount of time so you don't feel pressured, whatever that is for you. That could be 10 minutes, that could be a half an hour, but 
make sure that you, when you set out on the walk that you're not feeling pressured and take the time to let nature lead you where it needs to be so that if you find yourself walking up to a tree and taking just a minute to look at the colors it's okay that's really what it's about my son used to love grates so we would walk down the street and he would see the first grate and especially this time of year when it would start to have leaves in it we could stand there for a half an hour and there was a part of me that my heart would bleed and I would stand there and I would start to be like, oh no, my kid is obsessing over the drain, right? Because I wasn't accepting it until somebody taught me this trick of stand there and breathe and do all the other mindfulness things that I can, you know, remember that we've done here on the show and take a look at the leaves with him and to appreciate how beautiful it is. Even a dead leaf is absolutely a thing of wonder. And we walk by all the time and not notice these things. But now is a great time to take just a minute and look at it and go, that's really a miracle, that leaf, right? And when you take the time to appreciate it either yourself or with somebody who's on the autism spectrum, or with somebody that you care about that isn't on the autism spectrum, it slows everything down. You acknowledge that there's nature. My son and I used to uh, collect things and put them in our pockets, whether it was those little spiky ball things or pine cones or whatever it was. And he taught me about looking at it because he would just look at it and see it for what it was. What a fabulous thing. If more of us would take the time to sit and look at whether it's a, a dandelion, uh, a blade of grass, whatever it is, and notice that it's there, that it's, it's a miracle that it's in existence, that all of the things that took for that blade of grass to be alive and to be here and what makes it green and all the scientific things that we can think of that had to happen for that blade of grass to be there it's a miracle and if you can center yourself into that and breathe a little bit you find yourself really being present and it's a happy joyful thing again doesn't have to be an hour but i think if you'll go and devote 10 minutes to it you'll find hey this is a fun thing and maybe we need to do this more often. Well, there's no better time to do it than in the fall as things are changing. And I think you'll find that it helps you to deal with all the other things that are changing too, that the schedule is changing, that the light is changing, our day is changing because we're getting, we're winding towards the end of the year. Um, and we're winding towards, it's not really fall yet, but it will be in a week. We're winding towards winter. It's the evolution of the seasons. We can be in harmony with it instead of feeling that, ugh, I know so many of us have been talking about, oh, it's school and it's, ugh, it's just like different. It's new, I don't know, I wanna, I don't, I don't like anything I wanna eat, ugh, because things are changing. So take a nature walk, have that mindfulness moment, get present, and it'll be a wonderful thing. Hey, uh, I also want to say to you that we have a contest going on right now. If you watched last Thursday's show, we had the fabulous Kelly Lester on the show. And she is the mom behind the Easy Lunch Boxes. These are awesome, BPA-free, dishwasher-safe, really sturdy lunch boxes that have compartments in them. I'm telling you, the one that fits the sandwich one, which you don't need to use for a sandwich, if you want to throw in a pasta dish in there, you can, which I absolutely love because not all our kids like uh, or can eat a sandwich, right? Um, uh, but it just makes it so much easier and you're not using all the plastic bags, which is just miserable. And so you've got the three compartments, you slap the lid on, the lid which is easy opening for the kids, and then they have the little dippers for the sauces, which I absolutely love, and the, the lunchbox cooler that fits all of it. And you can put more than one of those three compartment things into a lunchbox. In fact, you can fit three of them if you want to. In any case, <coughs> excuse me, love easy lunch boxes. Kelly was so nice and she left us with one that we're gonna give to one of you. So what you need to do is write to us, <coughs> excuse me, 
autismlive at gmail.com. Write to us and say, I want the easy lunchbox. We're going to pick one winner at random, not this week and not what next week, but the week after. We're going to give you guys two weeks to do this, and then we will um, ship that off to you. So if you want to win, send us your address too so that we know how to get a hold of you. Uh, in any case, uh, definitely check it out because uh, they're absolutely fabulous. Do we have time for me to do the in the classroom uh, moment before we go to Bonnie? Okay, she says we have, Samantha's in charge, so we have time. Uh, so on the show, we always, on Thursday, try to squeeze in an autism in the classroom moment. You know, this is so important to me. I just feel like this is like the heart of where we need to get to, that our schools are not keeping up pace with all the things that we know about autism. And this is for a very simple reason, that we haven't given enough tools to our teachers. I'm a former teacher, and I know that most of the teachers that are in classrooms are really good people. Because I don't know anybody who said, oh, I'm going to put up with what I have to put up with and get paid so little uh, because it's luxurious, right? <laughs> Right, that just doesn't happen. Teachers become teachers because they love to learn and because they love to teach and see that moment when a young person gets something and then applies it in a new and different way. Man, that's where you're just talking the whole sun and moon and stars to a teacher, right? And that can happen with autism. It absolutely can and does happen on a daily basis. It's just that we have to give more tools to teachers. And so we like to take a moment and hopefully we have more and more teachers tuning in to autism in the classroom. But in the meantime, for those of you who are on the spectrum and are parents, you can share these moments with your teachers. So today's moment kind of goes hand in hand with our wag the dog moment is to look at what exactly is it that we're trying to teach. So often in modern education, we, especially with our younger teachers, we're teaching them, you know, there's this core curriculum and we got to get it done and, and, and this is the way in which we're going to do it. Well, I think that's half right, right? I think it's important to have, to know what your end game is. What are you trying to get to and knowing specifically. And I actually love it when we have academic standards and say, this is what the purpose of that this class is. I love it when a teacher posts the standards that they're working on at the front of the classroom at the beginning of the lesson. It, I think it, it says to the teacher, this is what I'm trying to do. And it says to the students, this is where we're trying to get to, right? How can you really get to a goal if you don't identify what it is? I don't understand that. So I love having the academic standards. What I don't love is legislating how you get there. Because if we're trying to teach five different kids how to count to 100 and understand what those numbers mean, we might have 5,000 different ways to do it. And none of them are wrong. And all of them are right. It's just which one works for each individual child. And when we give teachers those 5,000 ways, and maybe we don't have to give them 5,000, maybe we start with five ways because there's five kids, then we allow the teacher to really get the job done. So I, I just want to put it out there to anyone who's watching who is a teacher, if the lesson isn't working, it's not the child that's broken. We need to go back to the lesson and find a different way to teach it. And we don't need to say, mm, we're just not gonna be able to teach this concept to this child. I reject that. I reject that wholly. And I think that good teachers do too. Don't buy into the modern education idea of, you know, we just first we assess and then we teach in this method, which is lecture and worksheet, and then we retest to see if it got done. That's going to work for some kids. It's not going to work for all of our kids. Get creative. Be creative. Figure out and tune in here and we'll give you more ideas, but know what the lesson is and then teach in all the ways you have to until you've taught the lesson. That's really education. All right, having said that, we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back with special education attorney Bonnie Yates. She talks about how we get it into the IEP and make that agreement with the school so that our kids are set up 
for success. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're at the ABCs and XYZs of Special Needs Conference. And this year, for the first time, they've got something really remarkable. It's the Entrepreneurial Boutique. These are all items that have been made and are being sold by individuals who have special needs. So we're going to do a little shopping and talk to some of these fabulous entrepreneurs. Come on. My name is Molly Rarick and I'm founder of Breed's Gift. We're a nonprofit that serves teens and adults with special needs like Chase here. Uh, we were founded in 2013 and serve people in the Conejo Valley, Santa Barbara, and LA. Our main objective is to give our participants the skills they need to gain a more independent life. My name is Shelly Cox and um, Lisa Zalagi and I are founders of Creative Steps and Create Micro Business Enterprises. And the, the items that we're selling here today are all made by the clients who have uh, passions about what they want to make and then they get the profits from what they make after we've paid all of the other expenses. We are here today because um, I, my goal is to be independent and also I would like to share all my artwork and I would like to sell. Thinking about at his young age being a businessman, you know, it's, it's amazing. I cannot be more proud. down dog next. So with down dog there are several different ways that you can do it and I want to show you first and then help right. you with yours so that we can work on what feels good for you. Okay? All right. Because there's no right way to do it. It's more about what your body likes. All right. So for me what I'm going to do is start off with my hands at the top of my mat, my headlights, my fingers are, are um, aiming towards the top of my mat and then I'm going to tuck my toes and then my head is also going to drop and I'm going to look between my toes. Okay. Okay. And my body should be, or hopefully, like an A shape. Or V. Or V, yes. <laughs> Upside down V. Yep. And so if your quads are tight or your hamstrings are tight, you might need to bend your knees a little bit. Send it to you. <laughs> or if your shoulders are a little strained or a little tight. Remember to push in through your feet, but also sometimes what feels really good is going down your forearms like this. You can actually start out this way instead, it's a little easier. So your forearms rest on the floor. You still tuck your toes, and then you're still looking between your toes, but rather than being on your hands then, your weight's along your hands and your forearms. Okay? All right. So. So, yep, you're going to do on your hands, okay, yep, so your fingers are facing the front of the mat, are you doing forearms, forearms, okay, there we go, wow, you're very bendy, very nice, and your gaze is right here between your toes, excellent, very nice, Jem, wow, awesome, feet are a nice distance apart, how does that feel? Okay. Awesome, you want to come down? Excellent. Good. Welcome back to Autism Live. Forgive me, I'm having uh, some mic clip issues here, but we're so excited because, again, it's Thursday, and we have the fabulous Bonnie Yates joining us via Skype. She's coming to us from Hirji and Chow, a wonderful law firm here in Los Angeles. Bonnie is an extraordinary special education attorney who donates her time to be with us on Thursdays and answer your questions. And, Bonnie, we adore you. Thank you for being with us. Hey, this is the highlight of my week. Every week I wake up happy on Thursday. Oh, I love hearing that because I love it when you're here, you answer questions, and that's remarkable. And you have a disclaimer for us. 
that we're answering general questions per California law and to uh, some extent the federal laws because IDEA is a federal program. So our answers wouldn't necessarily apply in exactly the same way in the other 49 states. You'd have to check and also if you have a specific problem, you really need to sit down with somebody who can give you very specific advice and that's why we, we recommend people out of state to the www.copaa.net to get a qualified or hopefully qualified, you know, education law attorney. So um, that's I've, just sort of where we start. Fabulous. And and tell us how we get a hold of Hirji and Chow because they're okay. so amazing. Hirji and Chow can be reached at 310-391-0330. Um, or you can look us up on the web, just H-I-R-J-I -I and Chow, C-H-A-U. And Shannon seems to want me to tell you, and I like to tell you, that we will, anyone who wants an intake, a complimentary consultation, that's something we offer. It's part of our, you know, satisfaction comes in, in giving parents some information that they can use so that they can go to their IEP and feel a little bit more in control of the situation because it's all about, you know, command of the rules. That's really you know, what we're all trying to learn when we prepare for our IEP meeting. So it's my hope that, you know, every week we talk about something that maybe fills in the gaps a little bit more and makes you feel a little bit more comfortable if you're preparing to go to an IEP meeting or some other idea, you know, process, whether it's a resolution session or mediation. And that's why we really encourage you to keep sending the questions because I'm guessing as to what people feel they need help with. But the specific questions are really good. They always kind of drill down on the issues. Well, and we we so appreciate you taking the time in all the ways that you do in your consultations, in, in your cases that you do with your families and here with us on Autism Live. So thank you for all of that. And so where are we going to start today? Well, we sort of had some stuff left over from last time that we didn't entirely finish. Um, what we were uh, talking about, I think, was, did we answer the question of, is it, I think we answered the question, is it possible that you would have uh, without specific services to um, um, correspond to them? I, I, I'll be honest with you, Bonnie, the, we, we lost a little bit of your audio because of the papers. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I didn't quite hear what you asked. Okay, what I asked was there was a question on the floor about whether or not um, uh, you could have goals in an IEP with no specific services to support right. them. Right, and I feel like we did answer that. Um, yeah. I yes. think that we said we said that yes, it's possible that the only person responsible would be the classroom teacher. The concern would be if it's a general ed environment, for example, are they really going to get addressed? And sometimes they try to tell you you don't need this goal because it's all part of the curriculum. But the the way it's supposed to work is you have an area of need. You have an area in which the student needs additional support. You write a goal for that area, and that's what then leads to a service to support the goal. And then there's also a baseline associated with when you start the goal that will be reconsidered, you know, in a year from now to um, evaluate progress. So one has to be really careful when they say well, we work on this in the, in the general ed curriculum, you don't need a goal because how are you going to get measured at the end of the year? There's not going to be any responsibility per se, for moving you along if there's no goal area written. Absolutely. So that was one of one of the leftovers. Um, the other leftover was, and you know, it's really funny, after 20 years of being a special ed attorney and not spending much time looking at the district's uh, procedural safeguards, which they, they hand out at every IEP meeting, I'm really finding that some of them are very kind of deep and profound in terms of how... They, they speak to the the stuff that we're discussing all the time here. So, Shannon, sorry about the paper rustling. I don't think we I don't think we talked about how, uh, for example, FAPE is defined in the procedural safeguards last week, did we? We did not, and that's a great conversation because I've got some parents that are having issues with that. 
Yeah, well, the, there's always going to be an issue with FAPE because there's no, you know, bright line test. It's, it's always going to be based on the facts and, and circumstances of the particular case. And so people are always struggling with what is FAPE, what is appropriate. So this particular set of procedural safeguards, which is reasonably current, they're from 2016, says that FAPE is defined as special education and related services that are, one, provided at public expense under public supervision and direction and without charge to you. So the first issue is that the, that the services are free. And that, you know, has actually come up in some cases where we've had districts tell people, go hire a tutor to work on your issue, or even better, we've got a teacher here who moonlights as a tutor. Why don't you go employ her to, to tutor your kids? That's not FAPE. So then the, the, the next point is they have to meet the standards of the California Department of Education. That seems pretty straightforward. And they have to be provided in conformity with a written IEP developed for your child to confer an educational benefit and are provided in an appropriate preschool, elementary school, or secondary school program, or in a non-public school if there's no appropriate program available in the school district. So that's, you know, how this particular uh, SELPA in um, Orange County is, de is defining FAPE. Um, they also have a, de a, a definition of, of uh, least, least restrictive environment, which I'm going to read to you only because we were talking about it last week in case it um, gives rise to any questions. So least restrictive environment means that to the maximum extent appropriate, so there's kind of going to be a balancing test there, children with disabilities will be educated with children who are not disabled and that special classes, separate schooling, or other removal of children with disabilities from the regular education environment will occur only when the nature and severity of the disability is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids, and that would be like a, you know, a behavioral aid, among other things, with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved sat, uh, sat, satisfactorily. So I'm bringing this up again because the presumption for all of your kids is that they're going to belong in general ed at least some portion of the school week. And it can't be said that they can't be in general ed because they need, you know, an American Sign Language interpreter, or they need a behaviorist, or they need a health and safety aid. Um, if they can make it in the general ed environment with supplementary aids and services, then that's where they belong. So I consider, you know, FAPE and least restrictive environment to be, you know, two of the most um, important underpinnings of IDEA. And one thing I've also touched on a little bit here, but I haven't touched on it much, is there's a requirement that the district give you what's called prior written notice, and they almost never do. They almost never do. And, and so this is something you want to know about because it can be useful in dealing with the district. So prior written notice is um, due to you as a parent whenever the district proposes or refuses to initiate or change the identification, so that would mean like eligibility, evaluation, or educational placement of your child. So anytime any of those things is in play, they're supposed to give you a written sort of position statement. Um, or if you revoke consent in writing for the continued provision of special education and related services. So if you say, I want my kid to exit special ed, they're supposed to address that. The notice will be provided in your native language or other mode of communication you use unless it is clearly not feasible to do so and must be provided to you in a, in a reasonable time. And then there are specifics as to what goes into that notice to make it sufficient. But that means that when you're going to an IEP meeting and you're raising the issue of needing a different kind of a behavior aid, for example, or you're saying that there needs to be more supervision on the yard or whatever these issues are, you know, the district has to tell you yes or no, we're going to address this and why. They can't just sort of, you know, um, string you along. So or ignore you. Yeah, ignore you. Yeah. Hey, Bonnie, I got I to gotta pause for a second. We just had a pretty yeah. lengthy question come yeah. in, and I yeah. don't even think it's something that you can address this week, but do you want me to read it so that we, that our audience knows and the person knows that we yeah, heard it and we can address it. it next week? Yeah, let's read it. Okay, so uh, they wrote it and said, for Bonnie, autistic grandson handcuffed by school resource officer 
for mm -hmm. refusing to get off of a chair and go to the principal's office for punishment. He was refusing to play chess with another student who we discovered was bullying him at school. The IEP was not followed. School and superintendent apologized, but the grandson was still required to go to juvenile officer where he was told if there was another incident at school, uh, he will get probation. The mother removed the child from school because she's worried he will have an issue where the staff decides to call in the school officer to handle him. He is now getting homebound services and is devastated that he can't just go back to school. After all, the teacher apologized and he was not disciplined by the school. He's an eighth grade, high functioning, straight A student, but he shuts down when overwhelmed and will refuse to move, uh, even lay on the floor when those things happen. They said this okay. is happening in Alabama. How can we address the school system using sheriff deputies as discipline to handcuff our special needs kids and exposing them to court and legal issues? And she also notes that a 12 year old was arrested uh, with special needs on the special needs bus uh, and taken to juvenile detention center the very same week that her uh, grandson was handcuffed. Wow. Now, I mean, if you were writing a law school exam in which the examinee was to demonstrate knowledge about how idea and criminal law work and how they interface, that would be the question. That is such a meaty question that we're going to deal with it, you know, uh, we're going to make it be the focal point next week. Okay. However, okay. I would I would strongly recommend this family to get a lawyer in the state of Alabama through the COPA list. They they need a lawyer. They need help, and they need help right now. That, that's a very dangerous situation, and it sounds like there's been a bunch of illegality, which we can talk about next week. Absolutely, and I you know I applaud the mom. I, I would I would have done the same thing to take them out until they can get it solved. But I also yeah, applaud, you, I you applaud, I'm sorry, go ahead. You don't want him getting hurt at school or on the way to juvenile detention facility or whatever. Absolutely. So, but I, I want uh, just a kid to have a juvenile case. We know that happens. It's bad news. Yeah. And I applaud the grandmother that she's saying, let's not just leave it there. Let's make sure that we can make something happen here so that the sheriff's deputies cannot come and arrest the kids with special needs for things that aren't even... You couldn't arrest anybody else for if you don't want to play chess with somebody. This is not an arrestable fence. Oh, exactly. that makes me nuts. I yeah, just, well, you know, what you're seeing happen there is the cute little six year old that came into the kindergarten with autism is now a full grown man. And so they would, you never hear stories about, you know, six, well, almost never, six year olds being, you know, cuffed and taken to the principal's office. This student should have a behavior support plan, A, and B, just because you're the school police and you don't know how to deal with the kid, it doesn't mean that your recourse when you need the kid to move is to handcuff him. So, I mean, I don't want to get too much into this because I want to think about it for next week. Yes. This one's got bad, bad, bad written all over yes. it. You know? But I appreciate so, you telling them that they absolutely should look at legal support ASAP. I think that's really absolutely yeah. true. And Part of the reason I say that, by the way, in a general way, is if they can snuff out the fire now, it's going to be a lot less expensive. If he ends up with a juvenile case, he'll either have to use a public defender or his parents are going to have to pay for his legal services and probably the expert testimony about why this autistic kid, you know, doesn't have the intent to even commit a, uh, you know, a crime. I mean, it's a very multi-layered problem. Okay. And just out of fairness to other folks that came before. Uh, I wanted to read this question um, that we got at the end of August because I, I think it has a response that we should mention. Okay. I adopted my child overseas. He has some global delays. We aren't even sure of the extent. Well, he should be assessed. We enrolled him at school and had hope for them to do testing over the summer. They didn't, and they're not legally obligated to. School started yesterday, and I'm just beginning to see that I'm going to have to get involved. What are our rights? What is the timeline? How long can they go without presenting us with a plan? So for that question, there's a couple of things. One is that from the time that there's the initial referral, you should, they should be requesting an assessment. And I don't know if they have or haven't. But from the time you request the assessment, the district has 15 calendar days 
to prepare the assessment plan and send it to you. And then you have upon receipt 15 days to receive the assessment plan and sign it and return it. So I think that's um, the first step for these folks. Um, there's um, a goodie that I sent to you, Shannon, that you can disseminate for your people, which I found just kind of, you know, goofing around. And I sort of like it in terms of special ed timelines because it's by uh, Fagan, Friedman, and Full Frost, which is one of the biggest school law firms in California. And when you, when Shannon posts the document and you look at it, you'll see it's kind of their discussion of timelines, ETC. So the first, the first timelines that are covered in there are the initial assessment and IEP development timelines. And they tell you things like, you know, they have 15 days to complete the assessment plan, but then if there are school breaks in excess of five school days, they don't have to do anything. So that's the summer. And then they tell you if the referral is received 10 or fewer days before the end of the school year, um, then within the first 10 days of school the next school year, they have to give you the assessment plan. Um, and then they have a note to the educators attach the procedural safeguards notice to the proposed assessment plan. So I think when you guys look at this, you'll see there's discussion about the timelines for IEP meetings and review of initial assessments, um, of notices to the parent of the pending IEP meeting, of um, you know timelines associated with um, the procedural safeguards, um, with the triennial uh, and so on. So I wanted you guys to sort of see what it is that they've put together. This is obviously, you know, something that they have developed in order to give to their clients. And so this is interesting because you can see when you look at this that a lot of the time the school district is acting, uh, you know, extra legally and they're not really following timelines carefully. So. That's one of the things we really look for in, in you know, analyzing a case to um, send it to due process uh, is were the, you know, applicable timelines with regard to assessment um, followed? How long did it take to develop the assessment plan? How long did they take to assess? And then how long after that assessment was completed? Did they hold the IEP? The IEP is supposed to occur no more than 60 days from the date that the parent consents to assessment. So I just thought you all might want to look at this a little bit. That's fabulous. Uh, and then we have another question, which we didn't cover. What are schools legally allowed to do to our kids if they're having behaviors? Our friend's son was handcuffed the other day because he refused to move his seat. How can I find out what my school's policies are? And then it says, and you put no, no restraints in the behavior support plan. So the, I think that's going to get covered next week. But the, the main thing that I want to say about that is that any student that's having behaviors, there should be an IEP convened and a behavior support plan developed, and that should be a behavior support plan based on a functional behavior analysis, not based on somebody's hypothesis about you know why the child is having the behaviors he's having. and. If your student is being restrained at school, they're supposed to be creating a written incident report. You should ask for those. You should always ask for all this stuff in writing. And if somebody's being restrained a lot at school, that's a pretty good sign that there's a problem um, with their IEP and their behavior support plan. Restraints should be used only, you know, in the event that the, the person or some third party is in imminent danger of great bodily harm or death. And that's just not the case when somebody refuses to get out of a seat. What you really have happening there is the school freaking out because they're trying to stay on their bell schedule and run an orderly classroom, and they don't have the skills in a way um, to deal with um, you know, a, a child that has behaviors. So, I mean, it comes back to the, the same old thing of training and so on. And, you know, interestingly, and I'm going to, I'm going to close with this, Shannon, unless, you know, well, there's, oh, there's always more stuff, but, um, 
So my husband teaches at, at Cal Poly Pomona. He's the, he's the chair of the music department there. And he came home and he said, you know, the focus in college now is really changing. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we just spent a whole day talking about accommodations because we're getting so many students that have IEPs and accommodations that follow them to college that we really have to focus on, you know, as he put it, this population group. So, I mean, to me, that's interesting. And I sent Shannon just, you know, following up on our discussion last week about accommodations, I sent her a goodie for you guys um, about accommodations for college, because you're not there yet, but like Shannon, Jem's going to be there, not not that far down four the line. Four years, yeah. four years. And we so, have that goodie posted right now on our Facebook. Okay, so that's good because what you see when 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 you look at that is that there is a whole other process, and it's different at the college level. Um, when the student goes to college, um, there's going to be an a priori event in in many cases before he or she goes to college, and that is they're going to have to take the SAT or the ACT, and so it's important for your student to get something in his IEP that would provide for, let's say, double time on exams and taking the exam in a quiet room, getting class notes, being able to audio record the classes, whatever it is. And then the college will have, well, actually, we're not at college yet. ACT and SAT both have a process that you need to go through in order to get your exam accommodations. And to give you an example, I was, uh, I was at uh, a center-based program yesterday that does a lot of one-to-one -one teaching of students they have a student there who's taking his ACT he's been given double time which I believe is six hours the pro the the test has like a bunch of different you know components like different academic areas he's being allowed to take his exam rather than in one fell swoop he's allowed to take it over several days so he only has to take let's say the math portion, which is 45 minutes the first day, and he gets a double time. Then he gets a break, so he's not totally fried out, and then he gets to come back and do the next part. So I would think that would be very huge if you were taking the SAT or the ACT. So that's that's an example of something that you know we're all going to be dealing with um, on this program, I think, down the line. And the same thing is going to be true for the college accommodations. Absolutely. And, we... Um, we I just want to say this, that if, if there are parents that are looking at doing the accommodations for the ACT, though, we've had several people go through all the hoops that they have to do to get the accommodations, and then somewhere along the line, it wasn't communicated to the proctor. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say, because I went through this with someone uh, helping advocate for them, that um, the ACT people will... If, if the accommodations that were in place are supposed to be there and are not met through a failure with the proctor, they will yeah. not throw out that score. If they sit for the test, they will not throw right. out that score. They will, re they will allow them to take the test again and they will allow them to do that at no charge. But just a little thing, if they are not meeting your accommodations on the day that you arrive for the test, my advice would be don't sit for the okay. exam because right. that exam score stays with you forever. Yeah, you know, the parents yesterday, because they're affiliated with this center-based program, um, are having to figure out, like, who's going to, you know, proctor the exam for them, um, and they're wanting to, you know, talk to that person in advance, and one mom was explaining how her local school, local high school, she's called them over and over and over again, and nobody's calling her back. Yeah. And so that's not going to be a good way for her to take the exam, obviously. She's going to need to set up something else. Absolutely. And, you know, really any school that wants to assist can assist. That's the interesting thing. So, you know, they were saying it doesn't have to be your kid's home school. It could be a non-public school. But um, what, I, what I'm seeing, and maybe we'll end with this because I know we're almost out of time, yeah. is that the colleges don't know how to uh, accommodate any better than the public primary schools did. And I have, you know, an interesting tale of woe that I can tell sometime um, about a client of mine that's battling her community college because her professors told her that there were no accommodations for lab classes. 
And now the school has totally changed its story. And they're saying the teachers never said that. And the real problem is she didn't ask again for the accommodations, even though she'd had them with the same professor the first semester. And so they've put her on trial. They're like, well, why didn't you go to the lab and study there? Well, because it was really noisy and I have an auditory processing problem. Well, why didn't you call this tutor we told you to work with? you know, because you were having difficulty in the class. I mean, the, responsibil- the, res- the response to all of that is, why didn't you give me my accommodations? Yeah. And yeah. one of her accommodations, it's interesting, sp- and, and she was made eligible by the college, not in high school. So the college's own paperwork says she's going to have trouble processing in a noisy classroom, and she's going to have trouble self-advocating for the support that she needs. And this is why we so, still have miles and miles to go before we sleep. But, Bonnie, yeah. we're totally out of time. I just sent yeah. you another question that came in while we were live from a parent with a six-year-old whose son is pulling his pants down in class, and she's afraid he's going to lose his gen ed placement. Uh, um, so we're going to save that one for next week. But I wanted that mom to know that I've just forwarded it to you um, for what you know kinds of things. And we may, we may uh, take a look at that from a behavioral standpoint as well so that hopefully it isn't an issue, so that there's yeah. no reason to look at. But, uh, but I, I, I want to know... Yeah. We want to know what the rights are next week. Yeah, we've got two big questions for next week. And, you know, I'm only one, you know, person in one state. But if you have a crisis and you're in California, I'll sure try to talk to you because I think it's just important that you get, you know, some ground under you. Anyway, I know we're out of time. And that's that's Hirji and Chow where they want to reach out to to be able to talk to you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, people, take care. Be well. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend, Bonnie. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, we're running really low on time, and our uh, we, we want to go almost immediately. Are we going to show the skills video? Is that what we're going to go to? Okay, so because we have Eliana Fajeda here with us to talk w- about the newest product from Skills, Skills Living. So first, take a look at this video. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living, the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life, including self-control, planning, and problem solving, effective communication, performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish. Learn. Become. If you watch Autism Live, you know that I am one of the hugest fans of Skills. Uh, that it is, I talk about it all the time in Wax Poetic about what an amazing, amazing tool it is. And we're so excited that you just saw the newest tool in the toolkit uh, coming to us from Skills Global. And so right now we want to welcome for the first time ever on That's the true. show, Eliana Fajeda, 
That's and right. she is, I, I worked so hard, you guys, to be able to say her name properly because it, to me it doesn't look like it's spelled, but it's, that's the correct pronunciation, Fajeda. She is the CEO of Skills Global. So welcome for the first time Thank ever you. Thank you. Uh, yes. to the show. We're thrilled to have you here and thrilled to have you unveil this new amazing tool, Skills Living. That's right. Thrilled. Yeah, so um, Skills Living is the product that we just launching this week, actually. Look at Autism Live, just <laughs> like, you know, one of the first ones to know. And is in response to what we just saw in the video, right, about uh, this effect of the falling off the cliff, sometimes they say um, the service cliff, which is this, um, it's, it's really a, a, a real, very um, um, uh, key pro problem that is happening right now, where, you know, we've been talking about children with autism for so long, right? Well, these children grew up. Now they are young adults. They're coming out of high school, and uh, we have found that, uh, or studies have found, that schools are not well equipped to provide the transition service, transitional services that they need, and that actually by law they're supposed to provide. So now you have these children coming out of school, and we know they're still our children, right? Yeah. And yet, um, they don't have a job, they haven't been prepared to get a job, and uh, they are not able um, or haven't been prepared to go to college, so now they have nothing, right? We often, I talk about like how we often we, t we are concerned about our kids being bullied, especially in high school. Well, it turned out that these kids now are depressed because they don't have even that. And they are just sitting often in times on their parents' uh, basements, just watching TV or, or playing video games all day long because they have nothing, right? And they don't have a job, but they don't have a place to go. And, uh, and it's, um, many of them um, are depressed. There are statistics that show something like 42% of this population at this age. Um, is uh, shows uh, signs of depression, so it's it's very sad. It is sad, but you guys have an answer, and you've looked at at some of the different uh, data, and you're going to help us to understand why this product is so essential, and then how it helps. That's right, and how we decided what needs to go there, right? What what are the areas that these young adults need help with? So um, some of the statistics, and we are pulling these, you know, there's some sources, and we're going to show some slides, you know, um, showing the sources where the, the studies that these came from. Uh, one of the biggest studies was actually commissioned by the United States Accountability Office to figure out what's going on with young adults with autism. So a lot of these uh, statistics come from that. But the first thing is when you talk about uh, vo vocational and life skills, right? So um, when we looked at that, um, the, uh, about 53% of them, of these young adults with autism, receive no vocational or life skill services, okay? And this is during their early 20s. Um, that's, that's, that's big. Yeah. That's like that population that we were just talking about, you know, the, of not receiving anything, right? It's horrifying, especially, you know, we're going to see in light of how other groups are, are serviced. It's, it's really horrifying. And it's important, I want everybody to know out the gate, that we can do better mm -hmm. and that there are ways that we can do better. And that's part of what skills living is all about. That's right. So you're going to see some scary numbers, <laughs> yes. but know that the good yes. part is coming. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So um, there's also this um, thing we were just talking about, the, the you know, the cliff, um, uh, falling off the cliff um, effect. Um, and we can show how these kids are really disconnected, like these young ad adults are disconnected where you see that more young adults with autism were disconnected from both work and education than their peers that are in special education. So 
you think like 37%, that's what this graph shows, had no work or education. But, and, and you may seem like, well, that's just, you know, students from special education, you know, they have issues. But why is that that autism is the one with the highest issue? Exactly. Right? The highest numbers in here. So, I mean, if we can, if we can look at that slide again, what, what's really significant to me is that take a look. I mean, it's appalling too that 34% of people who have an intellectual disability are also disconnected from work and, and from uh, education. But when you think about uh, the, the fact that a lot of individuals who are on the autism spectrum don't have any kind of intellectual disability and are totally capable of working, yes. These numbers are appalling, and the fact that it's worse than autism is 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 that much more eye opening mm -hmm, for us. That mm -hmm. we know that we've got to make a difference in this area. Mm -hmm. That's um, right. And looking at the comparisons of if you have a speech and language impairment, only eight percent. That's right. Uh, which is a much better number. We've got to get this tipped in the other mm -hmm. way. That's right. Now there are some um, reasons that these studies um, talk about, discuss, right? Uh, why that may be, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that they bring up mostly is the fact that many disabilities out there, physical or otherwise, um, it's the one issue, right? It's like this is the problem or this is the deficit of that student. So they create the, you know, government can create a program or nonprofits can create a program that addresses that one thing, mm. right? But now when you're talking about, uh, as we know so well, right, autism spectrum, Yes. now it's not only about severity or high functioning, but it's also like no, none of our children are exactly yeah. the same as the other. They don't have the same issues. Autism is not one issue. Right? I always say it's not one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. So how do you create programs that will address you know X for one um, student and Y for the other and Z for another and and we know how how complex this can be, right? It can become very fast. So it's it's that's one of the main reasons why these numbers are worse for autism okay. because it's just so hard to create programs that will address because it's not you're not addressing one deficit you're not addressing one issue okay and that makes total sense mm -hmm. but again we're going to get to how you've got a fix for that exactly exactly so we don't want to you know that doesn't mean that we should just you know give, um, we can't give, give up. up or exactly we're yes not, we're not giving up on anybody yes that's right no. okay especially this community right we don't absolutely ever. <laughs> but but the numbers get and it's important for us to see these numbers because i think it's what motivates us the numbers get a little bit worse when we start looking at jobs we yes. always talk about jobs and employment. That's right. So, um, you know, the other thing is employment or unemployment. And uh, one of the statistics is 58% of these young adults um, ever worked between high school and their early 20s. And this number here includes like if you worked for two weeks and never worked again, you put in this number in this 58 so which is not really representative of like oh i have employment right and i and i want to say too it's easy to look at that and go oh 58 well that's not bad that's more than 50 percent but hold on a second because that means that 42 percent of individuals between high school and their early 20s had no, literally no experience of working in a job. And when we know, when we look at what is gonna get you to successful employment, that is not gonna work. 42% mm -hmm. had absolutely nothing, not a, nothing, nothing. That's right. Frightening. Yeah, and then when we move to the next slide, talking still about employment, we can see how comparing again autism, you know, uh, these students with autism compared to their peers, um, autism is, is much worse, right? So 58% here had any employment at all when you can see that all the other disabilities that we mentioned before are, are um, here with learning disabilities, 95% employment rate, speech language impairment, 91%, emotional disturbance, 91, intellectual disability, 74, and then autism, 58. 
And see, this make, this slide makes me nuts. Yeah. It, it means that we, to me, we as a community have got to, and we've known this for a while, I'm not telling anybody anything that they didn't know, but I've never seen it put in those terms before. We've got to work harder, make it more of a priority that in those years, our kids are given the same opportunities of other people who have have obstacles mm -hmm. um, but the community has said well we're going to prioritize employment we've got to do that and that's we've got right. and in order to do that we have to give them the skills to be able to be successful that's right and for each student it needs to be its own individualized yes. you know set of of uh, skills almost right so it's like this is this is what you need which is different from this other student which is different from the third student which is, makes it so hard, right? But like, again, we're gonna get to what we have um, created that um, will help exactly that way, right? Create individualized set of uh, teaching plan for these students. Absolutely. Right? Based on what they need in, in, on an individual basis. Absolutely. So the other uh, statistic that is also alarming is, um, how many or how few, I should say, of the students go to college, right, to go, go to post-secondary education. And um, uh, when we look at uh, the next slide, post-secondary education, we'll see compared to um, their peers, again, um, autism is right at the bottom, just uh, um, not as bad as intellectual disability, but much but lower than everything else. Yeah. Right when you see like even learning disability or emotional disturbance, autism is still, um, you know, much lower uh, in terms of uh, rates of going to any college. And here is not really oh this they graduated from college, right? This is just attending going. college, second yeah. you know two year college or or um, any post secondary education. Okay. Okay. Uh, very eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. This is. Um, yeah, these these uh, statistics are, are really um, eye-opening. Yes, yeah. That's the best way of putting uh, yeah, it. Yeah, because, I mean, you look at it and you go, okay, it isn't just that this would be hard. It means it's hard, but other people are getting it done, mm -hmm. which means that we need to. That's right. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah, because there is two ways of seeing this, right? Only 36 go to college, 36% go to college, but then you can also look at it and say, there's, there are 36% of these students that go to college and my child can be one of those, right? Absolutely. I'll make sure that, uh, that uh, my student is one of those. And making sure that they get the opportunity. Because we, we learn time and time again that it doesn't, it's not like you just pack your kids off to college. That there's a whole lot of work that has to be done to set them up to go to college. And yes. obviously, if the numbers are this much lower than other groups that have a need for preparation as well, mm -hmm. then we've got to start looking at this differently. Yes. As, a, as a community, as individual parents, as teachers, as people in, and, and in the community at large and in the autism community, we have to start looking at this and changing these numbers. Yeah, there are 50,000, that's the, the approximation, 50,000 individuals with autism that come out of uh, a high school each year wow. that have, diff and they all have difficulties in getting services and, uh, and, and work. They're on and the, the services is that whole thing of, um, well, you're not a child anymore, so, it, you know, and unless you're being covered by your parents' insurance company, which varies what the a up yeah. to what age it goes, right? But if you're not, especially now, if you're being covered by the the school, now you consider a young adult, and uh, all the services that you were getting yesterday, now you're not eligible for anymore today yeah. because you you know you turned that age point and uh, and now you have to go and uh, prove eligibility all over again now as an adult and you have to go to each service individually which before was handled by you know the school right yeah. and and that just becomes really a nightmare parents say it's just like and, and you don't man often in times you don't even know you what you can do or not right. do there are no coordination of these services 
and the transitioning uh, services um, you know, or, or teachings in the high school were not appropriate, um, were lacking. So it um, it's becomes very, very hard for parents to, to help these students. And yet, when we begin to look at, because all we all want is to set our kids up for success, yes. right? Yes. So when we begin to look at outcomes, what do we see? Yeah, so in outcomes, um, again, looking at, um, um, this is autism, right, that we are looking at on, on our um, slide now. Uh, the things that um, these students had most challenges with uh, in their early 20s coming out of high school is 81% never lived independently. 68 never lived apart from parents and that means like you could be um, away from your parents but maybe in a group home or something right that would not be considered independent living um, but it would be considered a part of your parents so but 68 percent um, never lived apart from their, their parents um, 64 percent no secondary post-secondary uh, education like we mentioned 42 percent no employment um, no community participation, 32%. Ugh. Okay, so that mean, that's the whole thing we were just talking about, living on your parents' basement, doing nothing, right? No services, 26%, and social isolation, 24%. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's disheartening. Uh, and I don't want to take the show down. <laughs> well, I mean, I think before you can begin to but, fix anything, you have to look at what it is yeah. to know where you're coming from and where you want to get to. And I think a lot of times we, I certainly as a parent, think, okay, well, I'll deal with that when I get there. Mm -hmm. And often then we have the deluge of, oh, no, what am I going to do now? And I've been through this with so many parents now who get to the cliff and that, that I have started to, you know, try to think ahead. I think we've mm -hmm. all started to try to think ahead and, and, and get realistic about it. So get realistic about it. This is what the numbers are. And you might have a child who's 27 and be sitting there nodding your head and going, yes, no, I already know this. Mm -hmm. Or you might have somebody who's 16 and you go, okay, I hadn't really thought about it and seen mm -hmm. that it was that severe. Or you could be somebody like me who has a 14 year old, but an, or a three year old, it doesn't matter. But for all of us, we gotta look at what it is so we That's can right. know what we don't wanna do and get clear about what we mm -hmm. do wanna do. Yes, okay. exactly, exactly. Um, still talking about outcomes, um, our next slide is a summary of what we talked about. So 36% um, attended any college education, 30% at, at, I'm sorry, uh, attended any post-secondary education, ever att attended two or four year college or vocational technical school, something like that. And uh, only 30% ever attended two or four year college. 58% uh, had a job for pay that's another thing, right? Yes. We talk about having employment, and we were even talking about this, you know, offline just a moment ago, of how so often um, the students may even get something, but it's not for pay. Right, internships, right. and that's a great yeah. thing, but internships need to turn to employment. That's right, that's right. Um, 19% lived independently, and that's absolutely doable. Right, if you have the right services, the right teaching at the right time, and 31% lived apart from parents. Um, our next slide on outcomes continuation is 76 had any socialization at all in the past year. So that means that they saw a friend at least once or called a friend or was invited to any activity. 76 sounds good. But if you think about, like you were saying, like the other 24 didn't, and None. this 76 doesn't mean you're doing that regularly. It just means like, did you ever get a call from a friend or made a call to a friend in the last year, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, these the are the 24 numbers. The 24% percent who have had absolutely nothing, nothing. It makes me want to weep. Yes, because a whole year of it. Yes. Just think about that, right, to how that would feel on a day to day. We wouldn't do that with a prisoner. We don't put people in isolation because exactly. we know that it's cruel and inhuman. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So um, these are these are very shocking statistics, but again, we're facing them so we can get to the good part. It's That's coming. right. And <laughs> and let's talk about that. Let's jump um, ahead okay. and and talk about that. So um, skills living. Um, very much like uh, our skills for autism, right? There's that covers uh, skills for autism, as, as many of your uh, your audience knows, uh, covers from zero from birth all the way to teenage years, right? And so skills living is picking up from there. So it's picking up from the teenage years. Um, all the way to independent adulthood, right? So it's not age-based anymore, it's skills-based because there are no research or developmental norms about, you know, when do you learn how to write a check, right? right? Even though nowadays no one writes checks, but there's a lesson for it. Yeah. So, <laughs> same case. Um, so I just want to go really quick sure. over the different uh, curricula. And so in skills living, we have an assessment like we have in skills for autism. This assessment, again, just yes, very plain English, yes, no questions. Right? Does your um, your learner, as we call it in, in skills living, does your learner know how to do this? Right? Does your learner know how to um, pay rent? Yes or no? No, then here are the lessons mm -hmm. automatically, you know, feeds to you. Here are the lessons how to teach. Um, how to pay rent, mm -hmm. okay? So very simple, you can, by answering those yes, no questions, you will have the results of it being, here's the teaching plan for right. this student, for this learner that we just talked about, the importance of being for this learner, Yeah. right? It's so important that we don't have a cookie cutter ever in autism, but honestly, there are some things that when you have a three-year-old who's nonverbal, there are, there are some things that you know you're going to teach all three-year-olds that mm -hmm. yes. are nonverbal. But the older our children get, the less that that could possibly apply. That's and, uh, you know, when, whenever I'm talking to, to parents that have teenagers or young adults, uh, you know, I really want to drive that. Because I think so many of them are frustrated that they'll go to do something and they go, yeah, but it just didn't really apply to them. And mm -hmm. they wanted to teach them something that you know, was the one thing he didn't need to know how to do because he's already really good at that, mm -hmm. and so we lost him. It really has to be individual specific. That's right, that's right. In order to be successful. Yes, and skills living um, allows for that because it gives you a map of what to teach, but then the lessons allows you to enter the specifics yes. for that learner. So for example, we'll talk about, we'll go over, you know, the 16 curriculum. Um, one of them is mobility, okay? And over there, there's a lesson for taking public transportation. And one of those lessons is specifically on taking a bus. Well, it's, there's, we, we put it up to there, right? We don't specify which kind of bus or how much it costs or how to pay the bus. Like we indicate that you need to teach the learner how to pay for the bus, how to see the schedule of the bus, how to plan the trip of where you're gonna go and how to plan for time and all that. But it allows for the, the teacher or whoever is teaching this to that student, to that learner, um, to enter the specifics, yes. right? So now you know that if we are here in Southern California, it's gonna be, say, the blue bus in Santa Monica, right. and uh, this is the site that you go to. So allows for whoever is teaching this learner to put all the specifics, create all the specifics of what's the reality of their learner. Okay. So completely customizable. Yes, Love yes, it. yes. Love it. Which really becomes like a truly individualized plan. Yes. For each of these. Which students. is what everybody needs. Mm -hmm. What exactly. everybody needs. Okay. Exactly. Should we go over the yes, curricular areas? Yes, we should areas? definitely go I, over. Because I get excited about this. <laughs> you know, for me, it, uh, as a former teacher, it's it's kind of like I get excited when you go to an art store and they have all the art supplies, uh -huh. and it's like, what do you want to pick? 
Like what what do you want to do? And so it's it's like shopping. What That's skills right. do you want to give somebody? You can pick and choose what you want. Yes. 16 and, areas. Yes, and that's exactly how Skills Living was built too, where the first thing that happens when you set up your account, mm -hmm. right, and you enter the learner um, information, name and demographics, um, the system uh, asks you exactly that. Here are the 16 areas, and we call it curriculum, but like say like these are the 16 areas which ones do you, is applicable to these learner? Which ones do you want to work on? And you can always add more later if you want, but that right there um, eliminates, it doesn't, it doesn't even show up, right? Things that are not applicable to your learner because may, they might excel in some of those areas. So you're customizing and prioritizing right out the gate. That's right. That maybe there's something, you know, because as you said in, in mobility, you have the ability to learn how to take a bus, how to do an Uber, <coughs> how to make flight arrangements. Maybe that's something you want your child, that your adult uh, that you're working with to learn later on. Um, um, but it isn't the priority right now. Right now, you might need something else, and you really get to be in charge of that, of saying, here's what we want to work on. That's exactly true. Okay, love that. <clears throat> we appreciate that. So, okay. the areas are cognition. So over there you have beliefs, cause and effect. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Deception, emotions. You also have... Um, <clears throat> I, I, it's it's the curse of this studio. Sometimes the air conditioning comes on and I get a tickle as well. Uh, but this is, I would say this is probably similar to um, the cognition curriculum that we're familiar with from, from skills originally. All the same kinds of things. We talk about this on the show, that it's important for people to understand that they are a thinking person and that how they think and look at things affects how they see the world and that other people will think and bring their beliefs and thoughts in and once we can teach that concept to people then you have perspective taking which really changes the game for that's anyone. right that's right and in this case that uh, those lessons may seem to be the same ones that we see on skills for autism mm -hmm. right for the younger uh, students, but actually it's tailored for the young adult. Got right? it. The other one is community community integration. So things like accessing library or voting. There's a lesson for voting, which we, is very which exciting. We love. That's a very exciting. <laughs> exactly. So really integrating, you know, the individual in the community, right? So if you have uh, a young adult who's on the spectrum, who's in that 24% that we talked about before, where mm -hmm. they're having no community interaction, we don't just sit there and go, ah, shucks. <clears throat> yeah. This is a way to work through a series of steps and lessons to make it so that that individual can, when they want to interact with the community exactly Great. exactly volunteering etc so yes absolutely because we don't want to be teaching these young adults just how to survive or how to not to be a burden on a parent because it's an aging parent and what's going to happen to that the young adult that we are so concerned as an adult what's going to happen right to to my child um, we don't want them to be just surviving Right, we want them to be truly you know, have an independent life, right, uh, where they are just um, um, you know contributing to the community in various ways, not just to, you know like yeah. I said, just being home, surviving, just being able to be by themselves. That's not the purpose, right? And we all have a right to that, but I think sometimes as parents, we get so overwhelmed by all the other things that we had to teach our kids. And, and we don't have the tools, and we go, oh, I want them to be more integrated in the community, but I don't know how. Yeah. This gives you the roadmap so exactly. that you, you have the way exactly. to do it. Exactly, I like right. that word, roadmap. That's exactly what that is. <laughs> um, you know, another one is employment. So that's another curriculum. And over there, you'll find things like completing employment forms and application, uh, interviewing skills, right? That can be really um, daunting. But I like some of the things that we put over there, which is always like taking you to um, the more complex things, like to follow up to an interview, 
right? So don't just show up to the interview and be a robot and just do these things, but actually following up properly. So maybe it needs to be via email if that, uh, um, um, or, or it needs to be a phone call and mm -hmm. how to appropriately, you know, follow up to the interview so that you go, really go after employment, right? Yeah. yeah. Any of you who are, mm -hmm. are watching who are having this moment like I am where, you know, there's always things that we all want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And I've said this fairly recently. I just wish I knew how to do this. I wish somebody would just give me the step-by-step -step of how to do this. And if you thought <clears throat> that for someone that you care about that's on the autism spectrum, this really skills living, this mm -hmm. is it. It's yes. here. It's here yes. now. Yes. Okay. So the next one would be executive functions, right? So language flexibility, part of phrasing, um, simple problem solving. Um, I love that, teaching how to um, uh, detect sarcasm. Yeah. Right? That's a, and we, we talk about executive functions all yeah. the time here on the show, that you can be wildly brilliant and you can take lots of action, but if you're not checking to make sure, you know, how are things working, one little thing can take you off. And we all experience this, whether we're on the spectrum or not, and almost always, it's an executive function mm -hmm. problem. That's right. That if identified and, and triaged and corrected, can make success happen. So That's if right. there's any kind of goal-oriented behavior to get to and be successful, it's mm -hmm. all in the executive functions yeah, arena. Exactly, exactly. And in this area here, it's tricked, it's uh, tweaked to um, be uh, appropriate for the young adult and not anymore, you know, the young student. Absolutely. Right? Wonderful. Um, the other area is functional communication. And again, like that conversation we were having earlier, which is not all the curriculum will be appropriate for every student, right? Right? So we're really allowing for the spectrum and, you know, from the most severe to the highest functioning um, learner um, and, and make it applicable to all that audience, right? Um, same thing for grade level uh, academics. Um, then we have a health and safety. Um, calling 911, for example, caring for acne. So it's like it's the the health and safety. So there's things like on the personal care arena as mm -hmm. well. So caring for minor cuts, mm -hmm. right? If you're living by yourself, you needed to be able to things that uh, we may not think of, you know, the need to teach until it happens, right? So uh, then these learners will be able to learn ahead of time and ahead of happening, right? Um, there's a lesson there of earthquake safety um, and we don't have one but it's very timely because we got these requests um, uh, already you know there were some some of our customers who were beta testing the tool so we already got uh, the request for hurricane and tornado safety which we are working on it as we speak to add to to the tool Wonderful. right um, housing so uh, community um, housing rules, for example, or paying rent, how uh, roommates, how to find them, how to um, choose roommates, paying utilities. Um, one that I find really interesting, uh, one of the lessons is what happens if you don't pay rent? Mm. So it's not just yeah. a, exactly. So there is a lesson specifically for that. What happens if you don't pay rent? Right? So yeah. that you understand the consequences of it, not just how do I pay rent, right? Amazing. Yeah. Uh, another one is, we call it independent living. And this one is things like from hair care, making a bed, nail care, but then things that go beyond that, right? Like gardening, for example. That's how I, I find that really neat <laughs> that we have that. <laughs> like right? That. It's just like it goes beyond, right? right? Which takes us to the next one, which is leisure. That's one that we got um, a lot of requests for. Like, I don't want my students to just, like we said, survive. Right? Yes. How can they have a fulfilling life? So leisure is part of that. So we have things like um, biking, bowling, hiking, um, uh, locker room etiquette, 
right? Things of that nature, arriving to a facility. So um, it's um, a lot of, uh, you know, be able to survive and, and beyond be able to survive, right? Yeah. Um, the other one is mobility that we were just talking about, the bus, right? So, but there's... And I, I heard mobility and I thought, you know, I thought you were talking about gross motor, but it's, uh -huh. it's literally how we get from point A to a point B on a daily basis. Exactly. That's exactly what that is. So I have here like booking a flight, uh, riding an elevator. Mm. That's part of mobility as well. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> such a great lesson. Can I just really quickly, and I know we're running out of time, but I have been on a trip with my son and I said to somebody, I need the riding the elevator thing because there are many variables and sometimes he stands in the wrong place and he's too big and it makes people nervous. Uh -huh. And he got a dirty look from people when we were in New Orleans because they were like, doesn't he know? But he didn't know where to stand. So mm -hmm. I love this. Riding yes, the yes, elevator. exactly. Uh, paying for a taxi ride, uh, calling a, you know, uh, order an Uber, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, very, very reality yes. of, of everyday reality. Um, there's also personal responsibility, so social planning and other things. But one of my favorites is pet care. Oh, very good. So, you know, we know pets make... reduce stress, but exactly. if they don't take care of them, that, then it's exactly. more stressful. Exactly, exactly. Um, then we have relationship skills. And here is things like apologizing, assertiveness, compliments, constructive criticism, um, basically having minif meaningful relationships, okay? And um, then we have, which takes to social skills, eye contact, humor, and jokes. Um, technology. Uh, I love this one because it's it goes from um, setting an alarm clock all the way to using a fax machines. Now we don't use as much but in an office you do. Yes. So a lot of the vocational stuff is here where like basic phone skills, uh, business phone skills, okay, uh, making copies. So lots of different areas of technology that is not just personal, but it's like in an office as well, which you take us to the most favorite one, which is the last one, which is vocational. And here vocational, we um, loading 25 different jobs in there. So it takes us way more than um, um, packing groceries, bagging groceries, right, which is one of those things that we hear so much. But it's, it, it has lessons on busing tables, restaurant hostess, uh, food preparer. Um, some of my favorites are apparel organizer, you know, the people that fold the, the, yes. um, the clothes, uh, library clerk, um, office clerk, data entry, dog walker, and one of my favorites, vet veterinary assistant. So, you know, like um, positions that are more fulfilling Right, and they are completely teachable, and can can put these learners, you know, contributing to society and in, in, in having a more fulfilling uh, life. Okay, so this is an amazing array, and it's available now. That's You're, right. Launched this week. It's available now. If people want more information, they should go to where? Which website? Yes, skillsliving.com. Okay. That's where people can um, go for more information and purchasing. Um, and also the login is in that same page, okay. uh, www.skillsliving.com. And, uh, or they can call 877-975-4559. And I'm sure we have that on the screen somewhere. Yeah, and uh, that's our number at Skills Global. And uh, we have a special going on yes. for uh, those of you that are listening in uh, today. Uh, if you call us, uh, you need to call to get that. Uh, if you call us and tell us that Shannon sent you, right? That's right. Or you, you want the Autism Live discount, just say, Shannon sent me the I want the Autism Live discount. We need to give them that number again. And Samantha, if you can get that up on the screen for us, it's 877 975 four five five nine and i'm going to say that again for those of you who listen to us on itunes and don't get a visual eight seven seven 
9754559. Now tell them what what the, what the Shannon special discount. Yes. The Autism Live discount. That's right. <laughs> uh, the Shannon discount, we should call it the Shannon discount. It sounds so much catchier. Uh is 30%. So it's a very sizable discount. I like and, it. And uh, we're doing that for a limited time. But uh, if you say that Shannon sent you, I need to call though, right? Yes. To call us, and uh, you get the thirty percent. It's it's a love. Thank you so much for extending that for our viewers. You know, I'm always looking for a chance to save you guys a little bit of time and a little bit of money, right? Um, and so then, you, you know, you can try it out, see all the different things that you can be working on. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very exciting new tool. And uh, there's so much in there. I can't wait to play with it. I'm excited about it. And I can see already that there are so many things that I've already identified that I want to teach my son. We don't have to wait until they're 18. That's right. We, uh, what's the earliest age that you recommend? Or, or is it just open to interpretation for people? Well, skills leaving is um, taking, um, uh, it starts for, uh, uh, for students that are, starting on transitional services, right? Okay. So, or, or the transitional time. And that officially uh, is 14 years old. So if your uh, student is 14 or older, they're ready for skills living. It's very exciting, you guys. So we're almost out of time. I really want to thank you. I want to say again, 877-975-4559 is the number to call and say that you want the Shannon discount. That's right. Some live discount That's that right. Uh, tell them Shannon sent you uh, to get that 30% off. It's amazing, amazing tool. Yeah. We want to, as we're ending here, we want to thank everybody for being with us uh, today. We want to thank Shoshana uh, Abraham for making me a cupcake. And uh, we're going to be back next Wednesday with Ask Dr. Doreen. Until then, uh, I hope that you'll have an opportunity to tr uh, try out Skills Living and that you will give your kiddo a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.